And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and <laughs> it is the Gazette. We are finally back. We are finally back after taking a impromptu week off. Um, we've got we've got the CEO of Zadari Enterprises with with us. <laughs> We're almost to a million percent. Soon enough, even a Matsu guy will have to bow at our feet. Well, given the fact that he's that he's that he's no longer a CEO and just the and just the head of the Thouser department, i.e., running the electrical room, with a bunch of dogs, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if it, I wonder if he has Nintendo dogs on the D, on his DS or something. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but yeah, the. After, I was I was dreading the doing the Sigmar doing the um, Sigmar Soulbound review this week. Now that I actually had some time to sit, to sit down, to sit down and really deep dive into that game, uh, it's not bad. Um, I do th I do think that I do think that a lot of the hate for Age of Sigmar is is largely a um, after effect of two things. One. The end times was just, which felt like Games Workshop being very spiteful about the fact that the Storm of Chaos event they tried a few years ago completely blew up in their face. If you re if you remember that little incident, um, I try to forget it. Yeah. For for the for those who weren't aware of that, basically, Games Workshop tried to do a narrative event. Where the, that was going to be in the players' hands, kind of, kind of like how Legend of the Five Rings do, does with the does with the narrative events like the Kotai series in their in their competitive scene. Mm -hmm. The prob the problem is um, there was no control. Like pe people were people were just submitting whatever people were just submitting battle reports even if they didn't actually do the actual battles. And because of that, what was supposed to be this big epic chaos invasion ended up with a giant curb stomping of chaos. That's because everybody thinks chaos is too edgy for you. Yeah. Um. And the end times. Seemed to be their attempt at trying to do it right, and in the process, blowing up the whole world. Which prompted a lot of um, theories that were very cynical, and um, how I had, I had ventured away from it and went with Ninth Age, which was basically a, it is basically an open source version of Warhammer's rules. Just with all the um, IP related material filed off. And you can get and you can get all the books for free, well, unless you want to get get a printed version. And hello, hello, Getting, uh, miss. Hey, Maddie. Hello. How's it going? It is good. It's going pretty it well. Is it is go. It is going. It is going pretty well. Um, just doing. Just doing a bit of catch up. The um, the w my personal interpretation with Age of with something like Age of Sigmar is, you should be playing that as if you're doing not high fantasy, but for lack of a better term, metal fantasy. Swords and sorcery. No, I'm talking. No, I'm talking the kind of the kind of fantasy that you'd see on heavy metal album covers. And yeah. who, what's, who's got background noise? I think that's Maddie. Maddie? Yeah, I think that's Maddie. Yo, you. Matt. Yeah, you had some background noise. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was 
started to play a game in the background there. Ah. Um, but with <clears throat> but with with that said, thankfully the reviews that are going to be coming in the next two weeks and the reviews that'll be coming in October. And no, I have no intention of doing a bu- doing a bunch of um. Actually, let me check my schedule to see if I ha- if I have a bunch of spooky reviews for October. Um, I don't think I do. And no, I no I do. It's just it's just that my definition of spooky with some of with some of them is going to be um is going to not exactly be the cut and dry because here's what it, here's what I've got lined up for October: Cult, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Project Biomotus and Maximum Apocalypse. Um, I did have something lined up for a fighting games month, but I'm not sure what month I'm gonna actually slot that in. It's probably not gonna happen until sometime next year. Okay. Um, I had thought about doing it this month, but er, doing it um in October, but. Doing it so quickly, at, so shortly after I did the Lord of the Rings month, just didn't feel right. But with that, good. I was gonna say understandable. Yeah. Um. Now, with that said, let me. Lo- it is high time to get started on the Kickstarter spotlight. The first one that we have, which, as you can see, I did back, is there is no light. I actually have the the demo for this downloaded on my Steam. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Um so they're asking for 30,000. They're currently at 29.3,000 with 23 days to go. They are probably going to hit a few stretch goals by the end of this. It certainly looks like it. Um they uh and it's sure it might be something we've seen before, but it looks like it's really well made. Mhm. Um like I'd I'd like to see them at least get thir- get thirty five thousand by the end of it, but I do like that they're not um, stretching themselves too thin when it comes to their stretch goals. You know how some how some how some game projects will um will put like eleven stretch go- put like eleven stretch goals, no ma- even if they have no chance of getting it that high. Yeah, um, I'm I I like the way that um some of the bigger names that released, you know, in the last couple of years, um, Bloodstained and uh, the Wonderful 101 did their stretch goals. Uh, they showed like the first three or four, and then you hit social media goals and, and the stretch goals themselves, and they showed three or four more and did mm-hmm. that over and over until eventually it coaxed people to, to get something like, I think the highest amount on Bloodstained was something like 16 or 17 stretch goals were met. Yeah. Um, now when it comes to, when it comes to the whole more to be revealed in this case, the vibe I get from that is they, um, they only, they only had, they only had gray boxed a couple stretch goals and that was it in, in, with the, with the uh, back door of, well, if we get, if we get higher than that, then maybe we'll think about it, but we don't have that plan right now. They might have a couple things past the bestiary, like mm-hmm. maybe a, uh. Maybe a fully orchestrated soundtrack or something. Um, most most stretch goals tend to see that sort of thing, but uh, it's probably something so far removed that they're just like, mm, better not to put it on the list right now. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> let's see. It's ho- so yes, we are we are basically dealing with a pixel souls like which. I don't know about you, but I have a soft spot for for going pixelated when it comes to doing a Souls like game. I think it's the fact that you can get away with a lot more than you can with polys. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Gameplay centers around an aggressive fighting style resembling a dance, where any mistake could be your last, but avoiding battle is not an option. A rage system builds up when damage is inflicted on enemies and the environment, and the hero can use special weapon abilities in order to gain an advantage in battle. Um that's okay, probably really? going to deep that's probably going to deviate it from being a souls like because with the majority of souls like games um you're encouraged to play defensively and almost passively. Uh, 
And here, that's obviously not the case. I haven't. I have the demo. I just haven't had a chance to actually delve into it. Hmm. Also, also, Matt, Maddie, just putting this as an aside. I see. I see. I see the avatar that you have for for a Google and and um, <laughs> yeah yeah rub rub it in you. F <laughs> He's a chill dude. That's all I'm gonna say. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll luck out if there's conventions in L.A. sometime sometime in the next five years. Um, because last I last I checked, that's where he's spending more. Oh. I think that time you lost me, rather than me losing you. Oh, that's weird. Huh. You didn't lose, I didn't. You didn't lose me. I'm here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can I can I point out how much how much of a chuckle I get out of the undead butler here? <laughs> you the mean the one used for the tutorial? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. So. Apparently, they plan on putting it on Steam, Switch, um, P PS4, and Xbone. Let's see. And they are planning on putting it in several languages, which I believe is um, English, Russian, French, German, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. I think the it's a little hard to tell with the pixelated version of the flag, but I think that's Spain. Mm -hmm. Let me take a look. I can, I can find out. I'm not on. Okay, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Spain. So mm -hmm. English, French, Spanish, um, German, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and probably Italian. Um. So let's see. When it comes to the story, hum humanity living under humanity living underground. So, not to, so. Um, you know, I would make a California joke, but that's probably in bad taste. Mm, I don't know about bad taste. Um, they would think the underground is too mainstream, so all the hipsters would go into the fires instead. Um. But given the fact that we're dealing with a um, we're dealing with a church as a central fig as a major figure in this story, um, I have to wonder if somebody was playing Blasphemous. <laughs> I love that game. Yeah. So as far as the inhab as far as the inhabitants, there the it's referred to as Chthonic, but I like that it's not exactly Lovecraft. It's not full on Lovecraftian. Well, Chthonic uh, isn't actually associated with Lovecraft. Chthonic is an old Greek word for the under the gods of the underworld. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's not a not surprising since you know the whole thing is underground. Yep. And when it and when it comes to the boss designs, the um, sprite artists have clearly been earning their paycheck. And some of the bosses remind me of a. Uh, of blasphemous as well. A bit of blasphemous and a bit of um, parasite Eve. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, Makes sense. <clears throat> I uh, I really like the art though. Like mm -hmm. something I've liked just playing around in the demos is, is is the art of the areas. In fact, the uh, the specific atmosphere that each region has is very. Uh, for lack of a better word, engaging. Mm -hmm. um, and if if um if there's, I really hope that there that there ends up being an art book for the game. That'd be nice. Let's see. So you have instant weapon switching, which can be used to make various combos. 
but weapons easily break under certain conditions. Except for your basic sword. Mm -hmm. But but apparently when they break, they, they get instantly replaced with another weapon from your inventory, which already get already gives it a leg up against against other weapon breakage rules. Looking at you, Breath of the Wild. Oh! <laughs> I like you, is. but that whole weapon durability thing was bullshit. Um, oh, it absolutely and, fucking and, is. And that's why um, Ubisoft's um, Gods and Monsters, now renamed to Immortals Phoenix Rising, uh, is a superior Breath of the Wild. None of your weapons break. Um, so it looks like the first weapon you get, and the only one that can't be broken, is your sword, Omen. And... I get the feeling that Omen is going to be your fallback jack-of-all-trades weapon, but I don't think we're going to be dealing with, say, the um, getting the treatment that the pistol has in Doom, i.e. Yeah. You ne I who the hell uses the pistol after the first five minutes? Unless you're doing a specific run. Yeah, I, I, I've, done a, I've done a pistol run on, on a... Nightmare difficulty. That was that was um, well, that was hellish, for lack of a better word. Look, there's a reason I don't. There's a reason that I never play shooters on the highest difficulty. It's not that I can't handle the challenge. It's that once you get into nightmare for uh, Doom, for instance, it starts being a little less hard and starts being bullshit. Yeah, it's it's usually pretty cheaty. Let's see. Then we actually, have... I find that Nightmare on on Doom Eternal was a uh, much more fair than Nightmare on Doom 2016, because Doom Eternal's whole gameplay loop is all about the the using specific enemy weaknesses to to generate specific resources and mm -hmm. continue to just keep flowing. The flow of battle is very very fun in Eternal, and so its Nightmare mode feels a lot better. Yeah. Now let's see. Then we have Superbia, which is gonna be a gonna be a fist weapon. I can I can see what sort of weapon I'd probably end up meaning in order to keep my gimmick. Of course you would. Um, and we have Mendacium, which is gonna be a heavy weapon. Oh, a giant great sword. Yep. Um, a Avaritia. A living. Fl yeah, a living flame shield. Actually, no. I no. I just realized what this is. This is the this is Royal Guard style. Yes, it is. <laughs> because you you uh, except unlike Royal Guard, you can hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then a um car a karma system, which hopefully do hopefully doesn't result in the Tor effect, but they're kind of um cagey about how that's going to work. See. We it have... probably plays directly into story endings, most likely. Mm -hmm. And some of the campaigns, um, they have they. I think this is a smart thing on their part. They have no intention of doing physical rewards simply because they don't have they don't have um, resor enough resources to guarantee a decent quality of that. Their mm -hmm. priority right now is finishing the game, which is pretty awesome. I mean, maybe I I, I guess their might their mindset might be maybe in a few years they might see if they could get some get some work done with limited run to do a fit to do a physical run with that, but it's not high priority for them. Isn't hype? Isn't hype train digital uh, an Eastern European? Or no, I don't think they are. Where are they from? Look, they're from all over, it looks mm -hmm. like. I wonder where they're based these days. And apparently the apparently the team yeah yeah, there's yeah, there's so given the fact that the director has is citing both Berserk, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Shin Megami Tensei, I think I I think we weren't too far off with calling it a souls like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like their little joke here at the beginning of the Meet the Team. Mm -hmm. Improvisation is our middle name, while iteration, <laughs> our mother's maiden name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's being... a very nice, very nice joke. Mm -hmm. Also, also, it, lo it looks like they're doing the whole thing. And as I mentioned before, in the interest of full disclosure, I did, I did, I did pitch in a few, a few bucks because I practice what I preach. I, uh, I might back this depending on what uh, my um my funding looks like next paycheck. All right. So next is the Bolt RPG engine. Which I is like the, go ahead. I like the idea. Is describing itself as a flexible, action-centric RPG built on fast gameplay and escalating tension, saying a bit Cyberpunk 2020, a bit Genesis, and a few tricks from indie story games too. And apparently they have a pre-launch version that's free for at, immediately after backing. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it free then. <laughs> and the and apparently the ha the hack bundle. And somebody's art somebody's already people have already made a few hacks of um, Bolt's system. Yep, I'm. I think. Uh... I, uh, like I said, I like the idea. The team doesn't inspire as much confidence. Uh, it's... I'll probably it's see got... when I when I scroll down there, but um, let's see. Pronouns what? in bio. Yeah. That that that's that's what I'm that's the, I'm just gonna leave it at that pronouns and bio. Yeah, if it, I mean, then then again they are. Um, I'm not gonna be too harsh on them. I mean, they're from Boston. Hasn't Boston suffered enough? The answer to mm -hmm. that question is no. Mm, Maddie, you know gonna, why? <laughs> I was gonna say, wait a minute. When when did Boston suffer enough? Is there ever enough suffering? No. They have to, <laughs> they have to deal with de they have to deal with decades of they have to deal with a decades worth of karma. Because well, let's let's cons let's consider this. First off, they ha they have the they have the stain of of being a of 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 um of movie blob. Um se second Boston is one of the most arrogant cities I've ever been to. Third, the Bruins. Because so, because when Maddie, you uh, Maddie, you you should you should know as well as anyone else when the Bruins got eliminated th this year, no one had any sympathy. Um, and of course, and of course, the and of course the um the fact that the pa the Patriots, the evil empire for years, is well dead because <laughs> everybody's well, gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh when it when it comes to this this RPG um this this engine i should say because mm -hmm. it's not actually a full rpg it's a this is a thing you can do to run stuff now fit it to whatever trappings you want to fit it to um i i like the uh i like this the simplicity of parts of the system such as your success rolls or d10s and th and you have a d4 that's thrown in for to the mix for um it's like the computer die in paranoia almost A, a chaos dice type thing. So, and then of course you have your extra effort, the tenacity pool. Um, the thing, the thing that's the thing that's going to get the thing that's going to get tricky with this, and if I ever and if the chance comes where they actually um 
give me a reply as far as as far as coming onto the show. Um, they are going to get compared to Savage Worlds and Powered by the Apocalypse, Ooh. especially especially the latter. That is that is go that is going to happen. And what they're and what they're going to need to show is that the, is that they are is that that's not the route that they're taking. Yeah. Now, is it is it unfair of me to make that comparison to a degree? Yes, but I'm not the one who's going to be making that comparison. Especially when you consider that the story game end of things um tends to tends to be a little more tends to be so much more insular. Yeah. Um which is also which is probably the reason why mo you may have noticed that a lot of the games that I end up sh that I end up showcasing aren't on itch.io, and I have tr I have tried to see if I can find a decent RPG market there. Not really. The majority of the games that I find are either powered by the apocalypse hacks or story games. Yeah. And while I've got nothing against Powered by the Apocalypse, well, except for the fact that um, whoever de whoever decided to use that as a basis to make a wrestling game needs to have their head examined. So sorry, parts unknown, but you but you made a bad pick when it came to your wrestling game for your little RPG project. Yeah, they're not all winners, right, Ollie Davis? <laughs> <laughs> Poor fuck can't win a freaking Crystal Mania to save his own damn life. It's not his fault that he brings in Ross Sapp to completely annihilate everybody. Well, okay, it is his fault because he's the one running the show, but you get my point. Yep. So, the next one, if I get the chance, I want to I want to get this guy on the show. <laughs> Unbreakable Iron Ranger Volume 1 is get is getting kind of a remastered version of 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 its webcomic form. I love this webcomic too. It's so good. Yeah, he's re he's redoing the he's redoing the art to give it more of an angular look versus some of the rounded edges that that were in the uh, webcomic form. Mhm. Mm um mm. It's eh. such a good. It's such a good comic. Yep. It really is. And so we're doing 200 pages, i.e. the first five episodes, plus the prologue and interludes merged. Some new story content, refined and updated art, behind-the-scenes content and, and author's notes, some variant covers, fan arts, and it's going to be in 6, six by uh, 10, give or take. Um, so the... The goal is to create a collection of the first five episodes of Unbreakable Iron Ranger, which I guess the best I guess the the best way to put it is what is what happens when somebody decides to mash elements of Guilty Gear, JoJo, and Gurren Lagann into one into one get into one particular thing. <laughs> I mean, have. <clears throat> I'd like to say that it's been done before because it has, but if it's done in a good way that's unique, like Unbreakable Iron Ranger is, mm -hmm. um, I don't mind. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and yeah, the, this is we've got a few examples of what the old artwork versus the new artwork looks like. And incidentally, this yes, this is the same guy who. Um, who ended up who ended up stirring up who ended up causing a bit of a stir with his um interpretation of Captain Marvel that was a massive improvement a massive improvement indeed uh, there's also a decent fan dub of the, of the comic that I had found I like how um he I think one of my favorite things about his dialogue is since this is supposed to be somewhat Western, 
he um spells you like the tree so mm -hmm. it makes it makes it seem like they're, like they're talking with a drawl what brings a stranger like you here well well you've got well the well ben it well, Ben is um is supposed to be from Texas, so so there's that's true. There's definitely that. Also, the f I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring up the fact that he is refer that that he's referred to by the enemy as as number two four six zero one. Like I wasn't gonna notice that. <laughs> <laughs> Two four six zero one. You know, because because it's not it's not like I haven't seen that musical a bunch of times over the years. Yep. Although I, and it looks it looks like he intends on keep on keeping on keeping the thing low because he. It said that he only wants to make like two like two hundred books because of the fact that while he definitely has a dedicated fan base with with UIR, it's definitely on the uh, smaller end of things. So he's not yeah. trying to overshoot it, which is a yeah. smart move. So next is Light Strikers, which yeah, is a... going for which um. Apparently, is trying to blend sci-fi, fantasy, and super-powered heroes into a anachronistic landscape. And um, for me personally, this thing looks very, very eighties. <laughs> blend sci-fi, fantasy, and super-powered heroes into an anachronistic landscape. Excuse me, Tenra Bancho? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think this is going for Tenra Bancho. I think. I think with something like this, we're dealing with. Something that leans a little more towards um, Masters of the Universe. Yeah, oh. I just, I just had to make the joke though because Ten Rabancho does the same thing, mm -hmm. combining the 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 anachronistic with sci-fi, fantasy, and superpowers. Yep. So, let's see. You have four starting classes: the Imagizard, Braver, Exalter, and Trick Scout. Which opens up general abilities and powers. After that, you choose unique skills, choose your own custom path for powers and abilities, and eventually create your own original bespoke class, powers, and abilities for combat and utility purposes. I think I'd like to be an exalter. <laughs> Only because they use Spiritus at an atomic level, and I can think of so many ways to use something at an atomic level. Yep. So let's see. Bravers... Are the war are the warrior approaches surrounded in a um, aura that attack with combinations of flurries alongside special fighting techniques can dash fly and blast beams. It's so, DBZ. Yeah, it's DBZ. Um, and it's also something that it it sounds like the monk class. So uh, for your gimmick, you'd probably be a braver. Yeah. Um, the vi although if, although if I had although. At the very least, I'm, I don't have to deal with Goku levels of intelligence, which I realize an oxy, is an oxymoron, but work with me here. <laughs> Almost as bad an oxymoron as military intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, Imagizerds seek to utilize raw spiritus energy and focus on spirit forging nearly anything they can imagine from their minds into reality and spirit casting powerful effects. They're the only class entrusted to raise dragon companions. It's a stock wizard. You know what? I'm actually going to go one further. They're green lanterns. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> green lanterns with dragon companions. So then we have trick scout. We have trick scouts who use spirit is to awaken superhuman senses, flexibility, speed, and coordination. Build custom trick blades that seamlessly transform between blades, a whip, and a bow. So, Ruby. Um, I'm thinking more Dante. Yeah, I can go with that too. Especially uh, since seamlessly. 
they said it <laughs> to be full of charm and finesse. <laughs> and they alter the very fabric of reality to skate across the air and stick to walls. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And pop and... in and out of existence, apparently. <laughs> Let's see. And ex and exalters use spiritus at an atomic level, as mentioned before, and combine it with technology. They design their own weapon tech and solo cycle decabots, sentient robots infused with spiritus that instantly transform into a melee weapon and a laser blaster. This is, I was I was kidding with the eighties ness of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was acceptable in the eighties. The, the I reason mean, it was acceptable at the time. Yep. The reason I say Exalters, uh, Exalter is my class here. Atomic level combined with tech, I'm turning myself into a human weapon with a melee weapon or laser blaster that's a sentient robot. Um, I mean, just just call it what it is. It's 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 Kamen Rider, <laughs> or even or even Super Sentai, uh, a sixth ranger from Super Sentai with his own mech and his own uh, equipment. Just don't be anal. No one wants to be anal. <laughs> let's see we we also have elves and dwarves as races and i'm going to keep calling them races because wizards of the coast can can go fuck themselves at least these elves aren't uh aren't um as completely up their ass as as elves in uh in the unspeakables mm -hmm. um, um these elves seem to be, I mean, like most elves, naturistic, but these are actually way more into nature. Yep. Um, let's see. So they have a introductory adventure, which definitely is going to help. Um, I want this game. I want this game. I want this game. <laughs> let's see. So we have... So, of course, one player is... So, the GM in this is called the Sage Commander. I'm still going to call it GM because habits. Well, I mean, Game Master is pretty universal as a, uh, as a, as a term. Yep. Let's see. It uses the Clash system. For most actions and reactions, the Clash system has you Clash rolled 2d6 to determine various outcomes where there is risk, similar to skill checks and hit rolls. Other actions happen as the players decide to perform them. Yeah, so this is very much theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. It's and I love, a very. It's, I love that. Def, it's definitely a rule. It's definitely a rules light approach. Um, it's probably a little more narrative, uh, a lot more theater of the mind, but still, all the makings and trappings of. Man, you know this kind of re reminds me a little bit of of how excited I used to get when I'd play Exalted. Yeah. I could see, I could see that, and um, for for what it's for what it's worth, um, when it comes when it comes to light strikers, I this is one instance where we are, where we are trying to organ, organize a date and time to bring to bring him to the temple. Code of Light Studios. Mm -hmm. Wait, they've they, they've had fourteen things backed on Kickstarters. Yeah, it looks like. Um, I, I'm going to check that. I want to see what other things they have that have been backed. Yep. Or no, they've backed 14 things. Excuse yeah. me. So okay. next is Scarlet Republics. Which um, they they described as what would happen if Fire Emblem had a love child with divinity and a Joe M Abercrombie book. Oh, it's a strategy RPG. Mm -hmm. Um. Set in the set in the city states of Corsano, a fantasy world inspired by the art of Leonardo da Vinci. That sounds interesting. <laughs> How do you base something? Oh God! Let's see. They're planning on putting this out on PC and consoles in 2022. Mm -hmm. Not surprising, because. Given the fact that they want to do a very choice-driven narrative, covering all covering all of those different options, that's going to take time. Yeah, they uh, they even hit a few of their stretch goals. Mm-hmm. Like, let me let me see what they're at. So, 
They were asking for 10,000 euros. They are currently at 36.9 euros with 18 days to go. Yep. And uh, they are the 35,000 euro stretch goal was a new class, which looks to be a class of made of two people. Or at least you choose one of them, but still. No, I think the class is just the strategist. It's just that we're seeing just that we're seeing the male and female art of it. Yeah. Um. It looks like they have space for one more stretch goal that they had planned because it looks like these were all the tatters of cloth were from a banner and uh, and they were all probably blank to begin with. So they have one more stretch goal they might have planned. It looks like. Um. So let's see. So we are doing with dealing with tactics. Um, seven, seven classes divided over twenty um, characters. Interesting. Um, they've built their RPG system to match customization with pseudo random growths to provide varied avenues for squad building and choices for how to grow characters. So no two players end up with the same squad. Um, that's a bold strategy. Let's hope that it doesn't get too R&D, RNG-ish. Let's hope this doesn't turn into XCOM. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So you play as Remo and Valeria, two mercenary captains haunted by betrayal and are looking for vindication and an opportunity to reclaim their birthright. You also get people mm -hmm. like Leonardo and Brunella and Jacopo. Yep. These are all famous names, too. Mm -hmm. Carmen, Gasper. All so, famous names. Remo and, Val and Valeria. Um, I wonder if this is going to be one of those cases where you pick one that you're going to play as and the, and the other one ends up, be ends up being your first ally. You know, kind Maybe. of like what we had with Astral Chain. Yeah. Um, let's see, and of of course one of, of course one of the first ones is Leonardo. And um, can I say that and I he, want his cape? <laughs> um, that's a cape that's uh, indicative of the cast Legionnaire. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. Let's see, then sounds like sounds like Maddie's playing another game. Mm -hmm. Um, and Brunella, who that's qu that's quite a um, that's quite that's quite an armament. Um, Jacopo, who I would I. I would make a joke about him dress him dress like a clown, but Harlequins are not are not ones to mess with. Mm -hmm. Nor nor is uh we we've learned a long time ago that insane clowns make very good uh, enemies until they make their own rap group. Let's not talk. Let's not talk about the, Let's not talk about them. We're having good. <laughs> we're having a good time right now. Um. I, well, one one obligatory magnets. How do they work? I had to. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> see then. Then Car then um, Carmen. She looks like. Well, it says she's a master scout, so, and she kind of looks like it. Let's see, Gaspar, who um. I'm going. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he's our alchemist. He's a Setonian scientist. He's an alchemist. Uh, yeah, it is a myth that all Setonian scientists are madmen. One could, however, be excused of that stereotype if Gasper was their primary reference, an enigm an enigmatic master of engineering inventions and massive explosions. Gaspar's greatest joy is testing his newest toys on the field of battle. Yeah, he's he's your sapper. He's he's your guy who blows up everything. Mm -hmm. He's your if you if you'll allow me to make the reference, Kang the Mad. <laughs> Good reference. 
He makes things fly. He makes things fly, and he makes things explode. The things that fly tend to survive. The things that explode, not so much. Do not. <laughs> you know, I recently, I recently, uh, it, it, it's the things you explode, not so much. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I actually recently played Jade Empire, so it was a good good reference indeed. Um, were you playing? Were you playing the PC version? Yes. If you get the chance, find the in style mod. I will do that. I'll look for that today. Is it almost makes it a Jade Empire 1.5. Nice. Oh. Also, the magic system in this game that I'm looking at, manipulating the pattern. Um, looks interesting. Um, kind of psychedelic and also horrifying. Well, it, cer- it certainly fi- it certainly fits. Um, viewing the viewing the um, pattern, um, it kind of reminds me of that magic system that was in Legend of the Burning Sands. Okay, yeah. And apparent and apparently, pattern sight is going to be an actual th- an actual thing. Within within the game, so it's not just fluff. I do like that. Yeah. So we have, when you're casting magic, you'll see it. So we have. Um, dy- they're saying dynamic turn-based combat, um, initiative, and a little bit of dice magic. But you do have to plan ahead. Um, pattern sight and manage st- and manage stability. There's shift mages are the names of the mages themselves, mm-hmm. or of any mage. Yeah. But uh, looking at the class list, there's two special types of shift mage. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Um, now it looks like with the dual system, they're trying to do something kind of like the weapon triangle, but not exactly. Mm-hmm. And apparently they are doing a trauma system. So unlike, say, Fire Emblem, where you j- where a character dies and that and that's it for them. You can bring them back. They will be able to come back, but they are going to be inflicted with some sort of trauma, a grievous wound. Mm-hmm. And if they take three of them, they're retired. Let's see. So here, what we have for classes: Legionnaire, dashing duelist with cool hats. <laughs> um. Let's see, then gar- Guardian, self-explanatory. Sapper. Also self-explanatory. Yep. Marksman, also self-explanatory. Shape Mage. The- Not self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. I read up on these two. Yeah. So Shape Mages are basically normal mages that have the ability to, to, f- to fuck with the bodies and minds of people themselves. Mm-hmm. They're the CC, I'm guessing. Yeah, they can either buff your allies or debuff your enemies. And pro, um, prod, let's see, prodigies, which they're vampires. Yeah, I I go with either vampires or ru- or rune knights. Um, a shift mage that can utilize siphon magic, shift your character into the impossible through the shift mage skill set, or become a soul vampire that feasts on the pattern of its enemies through the siphon mage skill set. This almost sounds like you're going to be switching between the two skill sets to make sure that you don't run out of your pattern fuel that it mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. how your mages could be super weak if they used up all of their resource in a single turn. Um, this, this looks like a way to mitigate that. You'd use shift mage stuff to make yourself bigger buffer ready to go at it. And then when you need more pattern fuel, you kind of cling on to someone and suck it out of them. And then, uh, then they die and you get more pattern fuel. <laughs> which de- which um, definitely, definitely makes sense. Um, oh, there, there's a uh, there's a there's a term you hate: Japanese RPGs. Mm. 
It's in their growth system area. Inspired by Japanese RPGs, we've created a system of organic growths at level up. Each level is accompanied by a randomized improvement in stats. And this means that no character develops exactly the same way from one playthrough to another. You can also influence the growth rates through sigils branded into your pattern by pattern smiths at the mercenary camp when trying to go for a very specific build. Interest, interesting. Um, now putting now putting aside my cringing at that at that phrase, um, the only thing that I hope is that it doesn't end up getting too random. It'll probably have the same type of spread that um, a lot of earlier RPGs had in the beginning, and I'm guessing that using those pattern brands to influence what grows is what's going to be key to keeping it from getting too RNG heavy. Yeah, this is... For whatever reason, I'm getting reminded of a Saga series game. Yeah, kind of. This reminds me a lot about Saga. Um, which... I really want to get the Saga collection that's going to be coming out on the Switch. They're, they're releasing the first three Saga games again. Mm -hmm. um. <sighs> this looks like an interesting game, but I'm not sure that I'd back it. I'd rather wait until it came out and got some attention before I tried it. Yeah, fair enough. Although I do, I do like one of the re one of the reward type one of the um, reward tiers called like one of your French girls. <laughs> no God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did you really have to do this one? Backer level over level over nine thousand. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Nerds, or, a lot of or them. What, or Nerd. what about the one that costs 1,500 euros at, look, Mom, I'm in a game. <laughs> I don't... I don't uh, okay, so... Um, these guys are all somewhere, I'm guessing, in Eastern Europe. Um, they're in Den... They're in Copenhagen. Oh, uh, well, then... And close enough to Eastern Europe. It's getting over that way. Mm -hmm. um, they all have marvelous hair and beards. I have found my hair, Kindred. <laughs> <laughs> but that still won't get me to back this game. We may share hair, Kindred, but uh, I, 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 I would need to see more proven about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grab me like Light Strikers did. Um. Well, we'll we'll see how we'll see how things shake out. Um, next is Fires of Athlin, and the and these guys all, from all the way out in Bristol are, are apparently they were they um they're willing to give me a shout out, so that's something. Wait, um, what? Where? Where? What? They're from Bristol, and they gave you a shout out on their Kickstarter. No, on their uh, Twitter. Oh, uh, okay. That's still something. That's still something. That's I was still like, good. Yeah, no, I'm just like, I... Twitter. It's still good. It's yep. still good. Yep. <laughs> um, actually, so Twitter they... might actually be better, to be honest. Yeah. So, um, let's see. They. One thing that I find smart on their on their front is that they intend on developing not just not just their PDF version, but developing the um developing it for virtual tabletop as well yeah i see that and, and oh, go ahead i was just gonna say um it looks like this is combined for both virtual and, and physical so mm -hmm. that's really good yeah um it is a bit unfortunate that they're calling their character creation setup organic character development, or OCD. Or maybe that's entirely intentional. You know, you know that's certainly a possibility. Considering the tropes behind character development and how OCD the character development uh, process can be for any tabletop nerd, I think it's intentional. <laughs> Yeah, I could see it. Um, <laughs> let's see. So they they want to empower both players and GMs alike, um, but what with enhanced character creation and and development, the um, 
as well as cre um, creative a creative license. So so they they want to write their adventures more like a storyboard for a play or a film, rather than well a book, which I'm perfectly fine with. I tend to write my own adventures that way, anyways. Yeah, and but I'm I'm thinking this is to again to give entry level people uh, experience. Yeah, and that's fantastic. Um. But what? Let's see the the problem that the problem that I'm having is that I'm tr is that I'm trying I'm trying to get I'm trying to get a grasp on what ex on what exactly they're do they're doing that's going to be different from other D twenty approaches. Um. Well, I mean, their their tagline at the top does yeah. say authentic locational combat system. And unique sorcery magic system. Yeah. So, what do they mean by that? Is the real question. Yeah, that's why. That's why I did reach out to them, and um, they did, and they did bite. So, we're um, we're trying to work out a date and time where I can bring them in. Yeah. And so the the real question is, what do they mean by a locational combat system? Yeah. Now that being said, I just. I just realized what um if I if I cuz the the art style maybe it's just me but the art style reminds me of the of the old Darkfall MMO kind of I don't have a lot of uh I don't have a lot of hope for them hitting their goal though we'll we'll definitely see at the very at the very least, at the very least, I tr I tried. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're a li they're a little over halfway, but they've only got seventeen days to go, and that's that's just for the basics. The uh, things like a, a virtual tabletop or spell cards or even a DM screen are stretch goals. Yeah. Um, so next we have the Devil's Bridge, which is going to be a five E adventure that is bringing in Slavic mythology. Excuse me if I yawn because five E. Yeah. Um, the reason why this has my interest is Slavic myth. I understand that. That's mm -hmm. that's that's always fun. Um, this looks like it's. So it says it's a mixture between medieval Balkan and Bulgarian Renaissance culture, yep. but they've also tapped parts of Russia, Poland, Serbia, and Macedonia. All the places whose forests are full of plate things wanting to kill you. Yep. Yep, yep. Apparently they're going to be working closely with docent Dr. Viha Beva. Sorry if I mispronounced that. From the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences as a consultant on ethnology and folklore. Uh, docent Doctor v v Vira Baiva. I, I, I'm going to look that up because that's. <laughs> I'm going to look that up because I want to know. Yep. Um, they're basing it on real locations in Bulgaria and the local legend surrounding them. It says the Devil's Bridge is a haunting site wrapped in dark and dramatic folklore tales. These stories unlo unlocked a sense of adventure and curiosity within us. The ancient secrets of the bridge are embedded in every stone waiting to be uncovered. Our goal is to create an adventure visiting real historical places and uncovering the macabre truth behind ancient legends. So it's definitely got an interesting approach. Um... We we got it close. It's it's Vihra Bayeva. Yeah. Because it's Cyrillic. I like the art mm -hmm. for especially for these monsters. These are yeah. some cool so, some really cool pieces of art. Um The Talisum look the Talisum looks like looks like something that's gonna make that's gonna make you stay up at night. The uh Yeah, the Talisum? Eh. It's just shadows. Just shadows doesn't actually scare me. What about the Skurzak? 
It looks like if it weren't already on fire, I could set it on fire. But it looks more like a gibbering mouther. Mm-hmm. Um, the Samdovia, I don't trust that. <laughs> you shouldn't. Uh, uh, I'm almost sure that they, they kill you much like the Yukiona does. Probably. Um, and as far as the Leshy, um, it's probably a case of don't piss the, don't piss the guy off, but he's otherwise nice. Yeah, don't cut the trees around him or he might destroy you. You know, an ant. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Then we have the people of um, Ardino. Um. So, um, Samadiva are a mixture of otherworldly beauty and um, succubus. It looks like. So shoot on sight. Okay. Yeah, they're usually hostile and dangerous to people. Men who gain upon the Samadiva fall instantly in love, or at least in lust, and women take their own lives at the sight of such beauty. Sometimes a Samadiva would uh, seduce a man, commonly a shepherd or a trespasser in her forest, and take him for her lover. However, in so doing, she would take all of his life energy. The man would then become obsessed with the Samadiva and chase her relentlessly, unable to think of anything else. The Samadiva, fueled by the energy stolen from her admirer, would then proceed to torture the man until he died of exhaustion. Like I said, shoot on sight. <laughs> These things are not nice to you. <laughs> Look, I'm just, I'm just saying. If I see something that, if, if I see something that's insanely pretty in the middle of a forest, I don't trust it. And and before anyone sa- and before anyone says, does that mean you'd shoot? Does that mean you'd shoot an elf in the forest if they were looking pretty? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> asking, <laughs> asking a monk if he'd shoot an elf. Um, that's okay, like asking l- if there are days that end in Y. Okay, let me re- let me rephrase that. I would not shoot an elf. I would shoot it twice. See, it's like asking if there are days that end in Y. Look, I've got a shirt in the back that be- that says basically it's the elf's fault. Obviously. Hmm. Now the next one. This is from one of our brothers. This one is coming to us from J- from James. Trails through the skies. Yeah, aka Ash. Oh, Mister No, Mister No A's. <laughs> yep. Yeah, James James Streisand. He's been he's been on the show. He's been on the show plenty of times. He and he and I don't care for don't care for Crawford. Um. And he's this for a while he had done he's done third party content for D and D five E and now he's doing it for um for, Pathfinder two. Yeah, for Pathfinder second edition, including wanting to put in a dog fighting system, because James likes airships and mechs. I mean what's not to love? Like What's not to love mm-hmm. about mechs and airships? Yep. Can you blame the man? So, for one example that he gave when it came to the, when it came to the airships, a dwarven zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> Flying dwarves. That'll be the day. Um, you're familiar with the fastball special, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I'm very familiar with the fastball special. Just saying. <laughs> well, Flying Dwarves was already done in a book series I read anyway, so Also, um remember that the dwarves in Warhammer have their have gyrocopters. Yes. And weapon trains. Which are exactly what you think they are. Unfortunately, they um, those those trains don't have enough guns. But I'd love to see I'd love to see one of those trains get in a fight with Deno and just completely destroy that just completely destroy that train. I think the problem there is that Deno would just escape through time when he started losing. Well, the very least I can say, if 
That's for Joe Denno, you fuck. Uh, <laughs> uh, now the other one, I just and I just did an interview with this guy the the other day, um, Planet Bound, which is doing pretty well for itself. He's hoping to get to the highest stretch goal so he can do a um, a ASL version of the book since since um, Jeremy Jack does have a background with um, sign language. Mm-hmm. And the approach that he he has been very clear that it, that there are two his his main inspiration for the game's design is rifts. He was much nicer to rifts than I am, and but even he admitted that there's things with rifts that he doesn't like, like the fact that there's rule schizophrenia between each freaking book. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 now, now his setup isn't exactly like Rift's, but there is a little bit of DNA in there. Um, what I do, what I do like is that he had a, um, he had a nice little acronym for the, for the, um, system that he uses. And given some of the classes, one of his, one of his, one of his buddies did say that the robot pilot looked like a glitter boy, and he, and he got really annoyed by that. <laughs> <laughs> not that I, not that I can blame him because glitter boys are overrated. Um, but the system is called the Edge System, i.e., every every die gets exercise. That's uh, yeah. That's um I don't know how much cringe I can I can I can convey via voice, but uh that was that was pretty cringy. <laughs> well And it's um apparent apparently the apparently in the between the time that I had him on first and earlier this week, he had done a lot of um reworking of the mechanics. Which I understand because the ori- originally because this game was originally just made just made f- for him and a bu- and a bunch of his buddies, but that's the ki- but that's the kind of thing that's too inside when you're making a full on book. Yep. And it, oh, it looks like it looks like he's getting help from Studio Two. I haven't seen them in a while. They're they're going to be handling um, retail distribution. Oh, that works. The next, um, this is another one whose developer I interviewed, um, Parcelings, which is a deck building tabletop game based on words. Specifically, using word magic. I am. Um, I like the word play with both the name of the game and the name of of the players. Mm-hmm. Which I'm perfectly fine with that kind with that kind of thing. Um, one of the but one. Of the, one of, he admitted that one of his big inspirations was was World of Darkness, but one th- one thing that he wanted to avoid was ha- was having anybody be a lone wolf character. And I've been following um, Parslings since its um, beta, and while it, it it it's definitely a it's definitely a card based approach, but unlike other card based approaches, this is just you. Like I call this a deck building game because you are building a de- a deck for your roles um, out of a playing card deck, but yep. it's not. Li- it's 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 um. It's one of those cases where, as you level up, you'll be able to add more car- more um, playing cards into that deck. You're not going to start off with the fifty two cards, yeah. especially since um, each of the suits ties in with one of the four um, ability pillars. Yeah. 
Although because because of how because of how wor how um words are magic. He um he made it he made a decision to not put in a not put in spellbook logic, because it just wouldn't make sense. Yeah, if the word is magic, then you merely have to use the word. Yeah. Specific well, specifically, you've got to use combinations of words that the that the players have together. Yeah, and then uh, and those are also decided by a D ten, D twelve, and D twenty. Mm-hmm. Let's see. And as far as stretch goals, we have some NPC cards. Not bad. Um, development of extra GM rules for quick scenario build. Nice. I hope they. I do hope that one gets hit. Um, some lingua quick NPC cards. Nice. G a GM prompt deck and a new mystery pledge level. But I like the name that he gave for the stretch goals: mobs and mobs, impromptu schemes, punny pets. Random encounters and urban legends. I think he's all yeah. He's already hit the goal for the um, for the GM prompts. So yeah, he's um, he's almost to random encounters for the bigger GM prompt deck. Yeah, he's at he was only asking for twenty three hundred. He's at eleven point two thousand. Yep, and he's still got quite some time to go. Mm -hmm. If all he right, keeps going that way, he probably he might hit urban legend. Yeah. Now our last one, the churn. Um, I w when it comes to this one doing a post-apocalyptic fantasy, um, the the um, big this is one of those that I th I think he may have um, I think he may have set things a little bit too high for himself. Even mm. though I do I do like the artwork that they're doing. But it's more. It's more of. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not quite. I'm not quite sold yet. Um, and even even though he's got a he's got a little bit ways. I'm not sure. I'm, I think asking for twenty two thousand for a five e campaign setting might have been pushing things a little. Mm -hmm. As you're. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm not saying that a campaign setting isn't going to be worth that amount. But if you're doing that, I expect you to be doing multiple books. You know, like one of those one of those multi-part um, campaign module things, like say, Siege of Tolkien or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the news, um, so Paizo is putting out a Secrets of Magic playtest. Appar apparently, that's going to be the expansion that they're working on with where. And right now, they're playtesting two classes: the Magus, nice. so your your um spe your war your warrior mage hybrid approaches. Um, Spell sword. Yep. I wish I I wish I had this when we were doing the when we were doing the Pathfinder playtest so I wouldn't make a I wouldn't make a spell blade that was so blatantly overpowered. <laughs> Which Lady K if you're listening to this no I'm not letting you use that class that was a one-off experiment and I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> OP spell blade. I was I was asked to create a custom class a a custom class for the for a on um, the concept of a spell blade, mm -hmm. and um, well, I did make it, and the the idea that I had was to was that was to focus it on the rune system that Pathfinder Second Edition has. The problem was it ended up getting way too overpowered. Like once once you once you get around once you get into the early teens, you're a demigod. That wasn't the That's... intention of what of of what I was trying to do. It's more of the impl the um there are some unforeseen implications. Yeah. Um the other class that they're working on is the summoner. And I'm guessing that Secrets of Magic is gonna have more than just these two classes, obviously. Mm-hmm. 
But, um, Paizo, the one thing I'm going to ask is make sure you give the martial characters this th the same kind of attention someday. I, um, I can't trust Paizo on anything these days. No, me neither, just... but um, I'm, just say I'm just saying, give me some time so I can be disappointed when you try. <laughs> because fe because fears of might still do a better job than you. Yep. So, next is the fact that Adamant Entertainment is la is launching a si launching what they're calling Star System with a game called Every Star a Destination. Oh, that sounds interesting. Now this the thing with this is that they're bringing in a bunch of writers. Who had worked on the D6 system? Mm. Um, mm. That could still work. Yeah, it's being led by Eric Troutman, who was the creative director for the for the West End Star Wars RPG. So this is basically a bringing the gang back together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, it's part of a new line called the Star System line. Which is going to be D six centric. There is one pro there is one problem that some people are that some people are having, and that is that one of the people involved with this is Gareth Michael Skarka, aka mm. the guy. The um, do you remember Far West? Yep, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, which still hasn't come out yet. And that th that thing was kickstarted nine years ago. Yep. So, not saying. I know he says that that project isn't dead, but um, it may as it may as well be when when you consider how long it ended up taking. Uh, this could either be really good or another disaster. Um, so next, I found out that Skull Kickers, which is a pretty a pretty decent a pretty decent strip, um, <laughs> is getting its own D and D adventure. And while I might groan about it getting a five e five e adventure, I do have to like the uh, title. Caster Bastards and the Great Grotesque. <laughs> um, it's made to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Skull Kickers. Or 12th. Mm -hmm. And... Appar apparently they are putting in some magic dysfunction rules... So yep. I might use that in order to fuck over the mages whenever they go. Hey, I can I can just win this battle by just by just casting meteor swarm, right? Heh. <laughs> oh, you say that. Look, I like ha I like having magic have some consequence, so that it does it just doesn't become a win button. Yep. Um, we do have an update on Cyberpunk Red. The full book is written. It's going through one final round of edits. The prequel to 2077, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. But it still may come out after the game <laughs> releases. Now, as... Now the question was asked why they didn't why they're not doing it as a digital download and they had said this year hasn't been kind to retailers and distributors. We don't kid ourselves that Cyberpunk Red will push anyone's ledgers to the black by itself. But we want to give small businesses, many of whom stuck by us and kept selling our stuff when the world at large thought our thought our Tessorian games was dead, as much of a fighting chance as we can. After all, we're a small business ourselves, and yes, we're aware of some of the distributors and retailers who carry our stuff don't fit into the definition of small business. But there's many who do, and that's who we're concerned about. The rest of the answer has to do with various market and business-related factors. This all may change if you feel circumstances warrant, but for right now, this is where we are in the matter. I that's Mike Pontsmith for you. 
Mm-hmm. Um, was basically, his basically his attitude is there was plenty. There's there were plenty of retailers that stuck that stuck with it, that stuck with us over over the years, and uh, we don't and we don't want to throw them under the bus just to get this thing out early. Yep. For the next, Which, um, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say it's very it's very much in uh, scope of what Mike Pondsmith does. He's always been someone who's been concerned about the little guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to what's next, we have a case of an absolute madman. <laughs> the founder of Jelly Belly is giving away one of his factories as part of a nationwide treasure hunt. And I, I got a golden ticket. I got yeah, a golden ticket. Actually, literally, I've got a golden ticket. Yes. He's literally. <laughs> He's literally yeah, turned into Willie Goddamn Wonka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is this isn't words. I have none. My lexicon is dry. No, words do not need to explain anything in this case. This is literally the man's this gone crazy. Literally... <laughs> um, he's about to retire. So yeah, I, think... I know. <laughs> I think that might be a factor because at this point it's a case of I don't give a fuck. <laughs> um, so appar so apparently there's going to be these treasure hunt. He wants to do multiple treasure hunts for these gold tickets in each state. Um, anyone who joins at least one treasure hunt will be eligible to search for the ultimate treasure, the key to one of his candy factories, and a sp paid trip and education to a candy making university. Nice. That's the treasure hunt that will be added after all the states have had a chance to play. Um, to enter a hunt, it costs 50. Each treasure hunt has a strict limit of 1,000 participants, no exceptions. That's the... still fucking crazy. That's why I that's why I wrote Madman in all caps when I found out about this. <laughs> exactly. I don't think Madman is strong enough. Like, you know, if, if it weren't for the fact that Hollywood shits the bed, I'd I'd petition to ha to have a, a mo to have a biopic about him done in the done in the style of Willy Wonka because this is as close to a real life Willy Wonka as we'll ever get. Just have someone follow him around with a camera and make a mockumentary. Yeah, that too. <laughs> so, we now have a Gone Gold date for the World Ends With You anime. It'll be premiering in six days, actually. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, it's going to be shown. Er, it's going to be shown early on MBS and TBS twenty eight. Um. But it, a, a, as far as part of the first episode, but apparently the majority of the show will be broadcast in 2021. So I'm guessing that the the September 18th premiere is just a hype drum up. Yeah, I'm still gonna watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that's get that um we got some info on is the is um Dragon Quest: The Adventure of Die. Which is a remake of the of the anime series in ninety one that was co written by Riku friggin' Sanjo. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's coming back for this. I doubt it. I mean if it's a if it's a if it's a remaster and a remake, they're probably just gonna use the same story beats with some with some changes. Mm-hmm. I mean if they brought Riku Sanjo back on, he would probably not want to do it. Sanjo, from what I've seen, is more interested in doing um, Futo Detectives right now. Yep. That's why I was saying I don't think he'd want to do it. Mm -hmm. He loves his expanded world of double. 
Not that I not that I don't blame him for that. And yeah, all we have now are ju are just a, are just a couple TV ads, but it's something. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who's doing the animation for it, but it's definitely on point. There's only a couple C CGI moments that um that throw me off. Yeah. And. I noticed that usually they save the they save using their CGI for when they've got a bunch of monsters on screen, which would make sense. Well, and really, CGI, even if it's a little noticeable, if it's composited well, I can forgive it. Um, if the if the CGI pops a little bit, but all the monsters look like they're properly traveling on the plane they're supposed to travel, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. It's when you get the um, weird cgi that we see in <coughs> sword art online <coughs> um where you know for some reason the ground is traveling underneath their feet when they're standing still uh that i'm like mm, that cg compositing is terrible the uh. whipping boy when it comes to when it comes to cgi for me is kingdom that's pretty bad. The whipping boy for me is Berserk 2016. Because god damn it it didn't need to be in CG. No, that was a case of somebody but somebody punching above weight. It, was... it needed to be drawn. It did not need to be in CG. Well, that and they they handed the guy who the guy who uh, directed he had only worked on slice of life work up to that point. That's why I say he was punching above weight. I'm sad. There's so much potential. Mm -hmm. It's all gone. At the very least, this particular Dragon Quest anime will will fare a lot better than that god awful your story business. <laughs> uh, true. Now, this next one admittedly is just a is just a rumor, but there's a small part of me that hopes this ends up being the case. That'd be very nice. I want it. A Ninja Gaiden Sigma trilogy listing apparently appeared on Hong Kong publisher Game Source's website. Seemingly a collection of the 3D Ninja Gaiden games. Um, calling it these. For... Go ahead. I was going to say specifically for the PS4. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, saying it would be released on March 2021 for PS4. Um, and appa apparently back in February um, Fumihiko Yasuda the director of Neo 2 had stated that the, that the team would be eager to work on a new Ninja Gaiden game um, I'm, not, I'm not jumping on this yet but if it, do if it does happen I'm perfectly fine with it um, I know some people might might cry foul at the, at the fact that it would be a port of the Sigma game, the Sigma versions, and not the originals. But um, the Sigmas were superior, especially Sigma Two. Yeah, because every time I bring up my complaints about Ninja Gaiden Two on the 360, people always say, "Well, you couldn't just ha you just couldn't handle the difficulty." And I'm like, I played Black on Master Ninja. That's not the problem. The problem was bullshit. Yeah, two had a lot of bullshit. Least of least of which being whoever decided to do the whole Gatling rocket launchers. <laughs> oh yeah, and giving every and giving everybody a throw that is not telegraphed. Please stop. You're you're dragging up memories of late nights after after school. Nearly crushing my uh, controller in my grip. Well, at the very least, the the. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the scythe was overpowered. The scythe was pretty off. That's not. That's no lie. Um. It it wasn't as it wasn't as overpowered in uh, Sigma it, unless you were fighting werewolves, in which case it de in which case it delims them stupid easy. And you know, maybe that's all we needed it for was to 
to delimb the werewolves. Well, consi- considering that their leader um, is the one who originally owns the thing, it makes sense. Um, I do find it funny that Itagaki publicly sh- publicly sl- um, slammed his apprentice, and yet for Ninja Gaiden Two, he ended up li- he ended up lifting the weapon that he brought into Sigma. The Dragon's Claw and Tiger's Fang. Mm-hmm. It's like... It's a little... I'd say it's a little hypocritical, but... Um, Itagaki is... In his own dimension. <laughs> yeah. No, that's... <laughs> I read that interview that he, did, that he did with Polygon, and putting aside the fact that it's Polygon, just... I feel I felt like I, I felt like I was losing brain cells reading that, <laughs> just because it, he would just go His on work... and on about these random about these random things, and I'm like, what the fuck did you just say? He's a Technicolor drug trip in human form. No, you, you know what it is? It's um, it's Bobby Heenan after uh, Iron Cheeks induction speech. What the hell did he say? Pretty much. So. CI Games is apparently announcing a new studio called Hexwork that will be working on Lords of the Fallen 2. Um, which I, I think it, I think is that I think is basically CI Games acquiring Deck 13 and rebranding them. Now Probably. Lords of the Fallen 2, I I want to I want to admit something. I came into that with the wrong idea because I initially thought it was going to be like a Souls like not really. It's this Lords of the Fallen is this kind of hodgepodge of elements between between um between souls and darksiders. Yeah. Um it's not bad, but if you're going at it the same way you would a souls game, you're going to have an interesting time um especially since it does it does the idea of do, the idea of going dodge roll heavy doesn't quite work, especially when you're in armor, where mm-hmm. your attempt at dodging is is all, is just a big flop, or a shuffle rather than a roll. Mm-hmm. So next, now this one is a case of giving us a semblance of hope. Don Bluth is launching a new animation studio. Good for him. To to do hand drawn animation. Mm-hmm. So wait, he's going to go back to paper and cells. Yeah, he uh, apparently uh, apparently this venture of Don Blue Studios, because of course, is to create new characters, new ideas, and new cartoons. One of his first projects is Bluth Fables, based on multiple short stories similar to nursery rhymes and Aesop fables written by Bluth himself. And apparently so, they're live streaming their developments because they want to be as transparent as possible. Yes, and it looks like they're not um it really does look like they're not actually drawing on the uh on their computers. Or if they are, they're first drawing on paper and then pulling into the computers. Yeah, I think I think that's what they're going with because this looks like a scan. Yeah, it looks like they that definite that that is not a texture you can get with um with computer. You can get a very similar emulated texture, but it is not the same, and you can really tell mm-hmm. this. Uh, the, just looking at the the, I guess the thumbnail for this video that's on the. On the site, it definitely looks like that's all hand drawn and colored, and, or, or it's all hand drawn, and then the coloring is being done in the paint thing. Yeah, because that coloring is very smooth compared to what you would see with normal color fill on paper. Mm-hmm. So next, there was a, a little project that was announced called Project Scarred Scar on the Prate here. Um, it's being animated by Gohans, who I'm not familiar with, set in the Akatsuki Special Ward of Tokyo. Ooh, fancy. Um, so it's an Akatsuki Special Ward, but it's run by two Greek-named organizations and then the Public Safety Bureau. 
Yeah, each each using divine tattoos that offer their own abilities, and eight and agents are impervious to bullets and blades. Unless, of course, that bullet or blade is imbued with divine power from another tattoo holder. I'm guessing. Yeah, possibly. Um, so, what is this based off of? I. If I had to, if I had to guess a visual novel because or a, vi a visual novel or, or a light novel because that's the way it often goes with this kind of thing, um, because it definitely had you know how with a lot of visual novels the environment art is C is CG that's the vibe I get out of this. But something. But another way I could look at it is that are we dealing with a Japanese version of the Warriors? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, from what I can see, Project Scar to Scar on the Praetor is an original series. It doesn't have a basis. It is original from the ground up for the anime. Interesting. But it's based, or it's based off of a, a media project by Frontier Works, maybe. What is the Project Scarred media project? I'm doing some background digging. Hmm. <laughs> at the ver at the very least, I might be able to use this as fodder for some of my, for some of my own experiments. Especially since, well, when it comes when it comes to some of the gun designs, I have to wonder if somebody's been taking taking some notes from Yasuhiro Naito. <laughs> so, the, the most I can find is that Project Scarred is a multimedia franchise owned by Frontier Works, which. Leads me to believe that Project Scarred is going to be on more than TV. Probably. <sighs> and, but that also leads me to believe that this show is the first piece of multimedia for that franchise. So it's still, like there's a concept for the franchise, but this is still an original video because it's built from that. And all right, that's uh, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Um, so they have Project Scarred franchise started in November 2019, and produced drama CDs, character songs, and voice actor live stream programs. So there's actually not been really any any development of the story except for probably those drama CDs. And drama CDs don't do large story beats. No. So this anime is likely to be like the first big thing with this multimedia franchise. Yeah. Um, okay. So next we have, well, we know the, the people behind a silent voice. Apparently they're working on something as well. A, a, a anime called to your eternity. This is going to really be like this. Hmm? I was going to say, they really like those, uh, those three, three word, um, titles. I'm hoping this is just I'm hoping this is just a coincidence and they don't get stuck with this whole with this whole thing. <laughs> um, but you have a the story is that of a boy wandering the wrong side of the Arctic Circle in North America who meets a wolf. They come to rely on each on each other to survive, but they're both keeping secrets from each other. This is the weird this is the weirdest remake of Balto that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to um who wants to guess that the wolf is a uh it, it might be a, a a waifu in the end um given who's involved with this i'm going to say that's not happening i am i i know i am too into the tropes of anime these days that i don't know i don't know <laughs> We'll find out. Um, 
Although, give, although given the given the fact that we have what looks like some shape shifting, um, that's probably that's probably not helping matters. I just I don't get I don't see it. So next, um, mm -hmm. we need to talk about how EA managed to fuck managed to fuck up again. I mean, hold on. L l they got sneaky, and then got caught. But they weren't very sneaky. So, they tried two weeks after the launch of UFC Four. They tried to they tried to th to sneak in these in-game replay adverts, which, within days of of people like Yang Ye pointing this thing out, they immediately dialed ba they immediately dialed back on it, claiming that they had gotten abundantly clear feedback. No shit. No shit indeed. That's a. Uh, it was one. It was a, seen. It was seen as bad form to put in these kind of. You can put in these kind of adverts in free to play games because that's kind of expected. But in a sixty dollar game, no. And a lot of people theorize that the reason why they didn't appear for two weeks. Is because is because they wanted to get if they had put it in the game dur during the review cycle, then they would have gotten crucified over it. You know the kind of th like how Black Ops Four put in microtransactions after all the reviews had come out. Yep. Hmm. And surprise! And surprise! Surprise! Then they ended up. Then they ended up playing um, da um, damage control. It's not too far removed from that whole thing that happened with um, with N with NBA Two K nineteen, not too long ago, that we had talked about, which had unskippable in-game ads. Mm-hmm. I remember. Um, then there's the whole thing with control. We haven't we haven't ripped on control in a while. Why there's, the dra the drama behind the game ends up ends up being more interesting than the game itself. I actually find the game very fun. I find it okay, but when I compare it to other remedy games, I feel like it's not playing to its strengths. Like. I think Sam, I think Sam Lake re I think Sam Lake really needs to really needs to start writing the ship in in a remedy. Mm. I don't know. I really like Control. I liked it better than Alan Wake. Um, I found but, Alan Wake really slow and really boring. But a, so a, a, so a while back we talked about how apparently the only way to upgrade Control to the PS5 and Series X versions would be to would be to uh, would be to buy the ultimate edition whereas companies like CD Projekt Red are not making people rebuy the games that they already own when it comes to this case. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently some folks on on um, t on Twitter and and Eurogamer and elsewhere discovered that they were able to upgrade to the ultimate edition for free if they owned the original which the 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 majority of users claim to own the digital deluxe edition, and it should be noted that this upgrade remained on current generation consoles, as next gen versions haven't been released. It showed at full price at first be, because I hadn't purchased for free the second DLC that just came out, and after I did, it said I own the ultimate edition. One person had stated. Um, so base so they ended up accidentally showing that yeah they can do a free upgrade. They're just choosing not to. Which I don't know if I'm gonna put. I'm, I don't know if I should be aiming this at Remedy or at Five Hundred Five Games. But either way, somebody fucked up. So next, um, now this is just, this is admittedly not much not much to go on just yet. But there was a business to business advert that seemed to hint that um 
there might we might be getting some more Sonic next year because of the 30th anniversary, which um given what happened the last time they tried to push they tried to push a game for an anniversary, I'm not entirely sure if this is a good idea to advertise the anniversary been, thing. Unless they've already been doing a major title in production for a while. That's certainly possible, but on the other hand, it's not it's um not like Sega is has the best um has the best set of priorities or the best organization. Keep in mind yeah. this is a company that was at war with itself for a few years. I remember. But and there's also a company that continues to shoot itself in the foot when it does dumb things like uh, not publishing the second Bayonetta. Yeah, and um, even if they even if they went to Kamiya at this point, I think they I think Kamiya would tell them to fuck off because they had well, their the publishing license. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to mm. say the publishing license has probably already lapsed at this point, so. Because uh, otherwise, Nintendo wouldn't be able to package it with a, with uh, Bayonetta two at, at all. Pretty much. It's also why uh, Vanquish and Bayonetta one got um, PC ports, just because the licensing was probably lapsed. Yeah. Um. Appa apparently, Takesh apparently three years ago, um, Izuka had state had stated that the reception of Sonic Mania compared to Forces would determine the direction of future titles in the series. So, um... Well, Mania was received a lot better than Forces. You know, I think at this point they should just dump... They should just, um... Br they should just leave a dump truck full of, mo full of money in front of Stealth's house. <laughs> you know, just, just so some... Just so he can... Go, just so he can go, What happened to Head Cannon Studios? They drove a dump truck to my house! I'm not made of stone! Yeah... Um, but then we had some bad news. The Venture Brothers is cancelled. It's dead. Right in the middle as they were writing up the next se as they were writing up the next season. Yep. It is an unfortunate, unfortunate time. Mm -hmm. Which um me, which it's definitely it's it's definitely un it's definitely unfortunate. Um, variety when Variety contacted Adult Swim, they were saying that they were looking for a way to continue the story with McCulloch and co-writer Doc Hammer. Mm -hmm. Um, but. But unfortunately, this means that now Robot Chicken is the longest-running series on Adult Swim. To be Wait, fair, um, it could be way worse. Yeah, because it's not—it's not like there's a whole lot of other good things on on Adult Swim's non-tsunami ends of things. You mean on any of Cartoon Network's non-tsunami end of things? CN has gone downhill majorly. The only the only driftwood for the drowning man is Toonami. Pretty much, which is pro which is probably the reason why they're leaving that alone because they know if they fuck with that, then there's no going back. If they if they fuck Toonami a second time, because they already fucked it once and it went in deep hibernation for a while, um, if they fuck it a second time, there's. No going back is is the least of it. They will they will crash. They will burn, and they will not re they will not revive. Mm -hmm. They are no phoenix. Yeah. So next, Ubisoft had their little digital event this week, and there were a few things that were discussed that I that I wanted to focus on. Um, first is that we we ended up getting some confirmation that, or at least some damage control that Skull and Bones is not dead. That they've been in full swing with a new vision as they dreamt something bigger. That worries me. 
I really, really hope that with Skull with Skull and Bones, they stick to what what it was promising, which is ship, which is ship to ship naval combat. Hmm. One of the few good things Ubisoft has done in many of their titles, mm -hmm. especially Assassin's Creed. Now there were the rumors that they that they wanted to they wanted to go they wanted to lean more into live service things. Um, well, that's certainly that's certainly a groaner, and and I would and I wouldn't care for that happening. I'm not going to jump on that partic on that particular um, conclusion until I've got something more than just than just um, rumors or development sources speaking under anonymity. Yeah. Regardless, a live service still mm, makes me a little shaky. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Well, if it if we get some more info in twenty twenty one during whatever show they show it at, we'll take that opportunity to rip them a new one. But then there was some good news. Holy fucking shit! For those who have believed, the time has come. What? <laughs> Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, the complete edition, is being released. Nintendo Switch, baby! Mm -hmm. And Windows PC. Oh. Oh, man. What the fuck? Xanatrix? You like your PC, I like my Switch. We're both happy on our head. No, it's, it, it's the PC part isn't the problem. The problem is it's via Uplay. Yeah. Oh. Well, no, you can get it on Steam, and then Uplay just launches in, the, in a light version in the back. But that does that one does say via Uplay, and I don't know if that means that they're gonna say via Uplay and just do Uplay, or whether it's gonna have Steam gonna be go through Steam as well. I certainly think that uh, Ubisoft is not retarded enough to just leave it on Uplay, considering that every one of their games that has gone to PC has been on both Uplay and Steam because they realize that, yeah, everyone's on Steam. You are more likely to sell your game if it is on Steam. Because this is this has been one of those that this has been one of those that's been the case of the. Be the um, best game that you couldn't play because it was delisted um, six years ago. I had it downloaded on my Xbox 360. And when I sold my Xbox 360 because I saw all my games were moving to PC, um, I forgot that this was on it. I sold my Xbox 360 before it was permanently delisted from everything. And now we're getting a sec now we're getting a second chance with it. I th I think what um what's he what's helping this come what's helping this comeback is that there's been a there's been a there's been a um slow return of side scrolling beat em ups in the independent scene. That and the fact that um very recently actually I've seen a lot of uh a lot of content creators around the uh, you uh, around the the YouTube space um, making those lists of best games you can't play anymore, or, or mm -hmm. and you know bringing light to a few of them bring light to it because this is data that is lost forever. We can't archive this, and they talk about you know PT and how it you know PlayStations with it still installed on are selling for insane amounts of money and stuff like that. Yep. Um, and, and they bring up Scott Pilgrim versus the world and it's been resurging recently. And so I think uh, that combined with the, the, the side scrolling beat em ups um, in the indie scene has uh, let Ubisoft know, oh, there's, there's still a demand for this game, not just this type of game, but for literally this game specifically. I think I think this is also a means of Ubisoft trying to trying to pull a trying to pull a redemption arc after after there after there was the um, personnel scandals in their office over the last that, few months. Yeah, 
And uh, finally, they probably this is the reason this was probably delisted and probably um, probably uh, a, an issue. Um, while the licensing issue with music was not actually a thing because Ana Managuchi even said, no, it's not a licensing issue with our music. There was probably still a licensing issue between Ubisoft, um, Scott Pilgrim's actual uh, author, and then the people who did the movies. There may have when been a comes, licensing scandal there. Ryan Lee O'Malley has, um, has, been ver has been very adamant for years about trying to get the game back, so I don't think it's on him. I would yeah. say it's most likely on them. I believe Universal did was responsible for the film, weren't they? Uh, I can check real quick. You know the one thing I really disliked about Scott Pilgrim versus the World, not just as a as a movie, but just a pet peeve. What? Scott Pilgrim versus the World is not the name of the comic. That's just the name of one of the one of the comic books. It's just called Scott Pilgrim. Um, and the, let me see here, the production company was, yeah, distributed by Universal Pictures. So if Universal decided to stomp up and go, no, you can't do this anymore, because this was only, you know, this was a tie-in game with when the movie came out in 2010. Mm -hmm. And, uh... When licensing likely lapsed for Universal, Universal probably was like, well, if our licensing lapsed, then since yours is a movie tie-in game, you can't have it up either. Because movie somewhere. studios... The thing that I've learned is that movie studios really do not like game companies. <laughs> movie studios hate video games. Movies take away... or I mean, video games take away from movies. And I'm not, I'm not even going to lie here. Um, video games as an interactive medium are the most engaging entertainment medium in the world. Well, they in the world. They probably hate that. There's probably even more hate with, with the current situations because they're, they're, having di they're having either distribution problems or, having, or being forced to adapt in other ways. And um, for video games, it's significantly less so. Yeah, because video games have digital distribution. Um, and a lot of platforms to distribute over. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know I say this time and again whenever the whole, but Steam is a monopoly thing comes up. Um, Steam's not a monopoly, and they don't try to enforce the monopoly like Epic does. Uh, and there's plenty of other platforms people can purchase from. You've got you know good old games, you've got GOG, you've got, you've got Uplay, you've got Origin, you've got the, the other platforms that the companies themselves came up, came up with. Mm -hmm. And there's no limitation. Nobody's trying to buy out so nobody else can use it, except for Epic, because Epic's a bunch of assholes. Epic, at the very least, they seem they seem to be less focused on trying on trying to do the buy up frenzy, since that isn't working as well as well as they had hoped, and instead is engaged in a pissing match with Apple that they're probably going to lose. They are losing, yeah, mm -hmm. because but... Apple all the fucking money and all the fucking time. Well, also, also the arg the argument that Epic was making during that whole case just when I when I saw when I saw what they were trying to go with, I was like, this has no case. Yeah. But I want I want to make clear in that in that particular debate, I am not taking either side. I know everybody has this notion that you have to take a side when whenever there's a um controversial situation. No, you fucking don't. My Especially side is I hate both of them. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, especially when both both are shitheads. Um, Apple more so than Epic in this case. Apple's always been much more of a, of a shitty, shitty company. Mm -hmm. Let's remember, let, let's all remember the time that they fixed an issue with a solder, with an IC that was improperly soldered, a graphics IC that was improperly soldered on their MacBook series, not by resoldering the chip, but by gluing a piece of rubber to the chip and allowing manual pressure from the closed case to continue to keep the graphics IC in contact with the logic board. Lewis Rossman had a field day with that one. Oh, I, I've mm -hmm. seen I've seen his videos dealing dealing with Apple, 
And um, especially especially since Apple has been a thorn in the whole right to repair movement. <laughs> not not just Apple though. It's it's any any group that has quote unquote proprietary uh, patents, they don't want you to repair that. You know, John Deere tractors for Christ's sake. I am so so over this no we still own the thing we sold you mentality that they have mm -hmm. i would i would legitimately tell apple or john deere if i had any of their products um you want me to pay you to repair this no i'm gonna repair it yeah i'm going to reverse engineer everything and i'm gonna put it up on the fucking internet yep now gods and monsters i um which 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 is now being which is now being dubbed as Immortals Phoenix Rising. Um yep. I watched through the 30 minute overview that um Yong Ye had done. And yeah, I can I can say that this might if um if this presentation is any indication and obviously this isn't the final build, but it has the potential to to play like a better Breath of the Wild. Um I would suggest if you want to see some more um, hands-on presentation because uh, Rage Gaming Videos actually got a chance to play the game. So did Yong Ye. And, and take footage of it. And, uh, and they also had a bit of an overview that's unique to them. I know Yong Ye tends to do a very straightforward um, presentation. Mm -hmm. If you want something a little more... I guess tongue in cheek because you know Josh and Hollow and and uh, Cotton are all very uh, comical characters. To be honest, um, their their playthrough was really well done as well. Um, I personally think that this game is going to be fantastic. Back when it was Gods and Monsters, I actually wasn't as interested, um, which is probably because we didn't have a lot to go on at mm -hmm. that time. And also the name is... Sorry about that. <laughs> and and also because uh, the, the name was, wasn't was very descriptive. It was just gods and monsters. Mm -hmm. And we knew it was about, you know, the Greek gods. And that, that was really it. But this, uh, this entire presentation where a lot of the media got to go in, play, and then take their gameplay footage out and use it for their releases... Which was that's that's brilliant on Ubisoft's part, um, actually allowing people to release the footage that they created themselves instead of going no 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 that's still under NDA no they're like no no go ahead show show them the demo let's, let's show them what we're what we're looking with. Um, I am fully. This is on my my list of games I must eventually buy that is on my phone. So, Although what what. What I what definitely struck me was the fact that the equip the equipment system in this is not falling into the same trap as uh, as other loot based games. In the in the sense that it's it's more about developing a playstyle like you'd see in say Hades than it is yeah. about um po about some pointless power level. Yeah, and uh, and each unique weapon you get. Um, has a different, a different uh, unique value to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not looking like you're gonna get you're gonna get a whole lot of variety when it comes to when it comes to your when it comes to your uh, toolkit. But I get, but it's pro it's probably gonna be a case of um, of refining what you actually do have. Which I'm perfect. I'm perfectly fine with. The only th the only thing is that the conversation between the gods that I that I saw in some of the footage, um, Prometheus and Zeus, yeah, yeah. Some some of it is a little t is a little too um, a little too comical. Um, that was intentional. Mm -hmm. the in The entire game doesn't take itself seriously yeah. because. Uh, not only is the conversation between Prometheus and Zeus uh, comical, like Prometheus is trying to tell a story and Zeus is like, but why? This is so long-winded, essentially, because Zeus is an impatient asshole. Um, 
And and sometimes when they're bickering, Phoenix will also then speak to them and be like, guys, I, I I'm kind of trying to do something here. So the conversation does include Phoenix from time to time. And uh, I'm just I, I I I personally like it because you you've seen the you've seen the art style. It's actually quite uh, mm-hmm. vibrant. It's a very yeah. bright game, even though it's a dark subject. So the the comic the comic theme between the straight man of of Prometheus and the funny man of Zeus um, strikes me as fun and also fitting. Yeah, per, the um, of course of course we know we know that the fa- the most fantastical thing that's been done with this sort of thing is is um is the fact that the Disney Hercules had Zeus as a decent father. <laughs> oh, oh! That uh, actually reminds me of a joke that they say that they say when you go through the tutorial for the first Tartarus pit, where um, Prometheus is, it, where she jumps down and, and Zeus is just like, "What? She can just jump into Tartarus now?" And Prometheus is like, "Well, when Typhon broke out, it broke open." you know, the boundaries between the mortal world and the god world and Tartarus so she can make it down there. He's like, oh, oh, so if whatever you say in, in, um, he says, whatever you say in, in narration is held true. And then he says, Zeus is a loving father and husband. (laughs) And, and Prometheus says, I don't think we can stretch reality that far. (laughs) It was it was one of the best comical moments. I loved it. Oh, and I am returned. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> yeah, that... Everybody's ha- having reverse now. It's reverse problems from what you had, Monk. Yeah, that's that's interesting. But it's still not as frequent. So that's all not in a all, bad thing. all in all, massive improvement. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely looking forward to Immortals. And that is my phone. I will be right back. <laughs> what? what an appropriate ringtone. I that's, know, right? That's been my text ringtone for 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the one, the one entry that ended up, getting a bit of, ended up getting a bit of debate was the announcement of a Sands of Time remake that'll be coming out in January. The thing that a lot of people got on got on it for was the graphical was the uh, graphics change. Um, and when it com- when it comes to it, having the prince have a much diff- a much different outfit. Okay, that's one that's. That's definitely one thing. I think the more, um, I guess the the best way to put it, the more uh, offensive part of that is that if you want to play with the original skin and weapon skins um, from the first release of the game in 2003... You have to pre-order to get the Back to the Origins set. Um, yeah, that's a gr- that's a groaner. Um, that's not gonna that's not gonna be a deal breaker for me personally. But um, it could question- be a dream. It could be a, it could be a breaker for a deal breaker for uh, other people though. Mm-hmm. Um, the one th- the one thing that I'm curious about is what is. Why just the first game? This is this is a trilogy, so why 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 not try why not wait to try and port all three? They might be. Um, I would think that this is more them checking the waters. Pro- probably. I think. Yeah, I think that they're going okay. So we know that the Sands of Time trilogy was at least decently popular. Um, let's try remaking Sands of Time releasing it and seeing how interest sits and if interest sits high let's go forward with the next two also yeah, it could be, 
by selling Witness it three that. pieces, they get three they get three paychecks. Yep. Um. We'll see. We'll see how we'll see how it ends up how it ends up playing out. I wonder if they'd release classic for like two for like ten bucks on Steam or or something as well, so that people um, so, class- pe- so that people can enjoy the pain of that. No oh, God, you, you I remember it. Nineteen eighty nine's Prince of Persia. No, that no oh. that um re- that there was there was a remake of the eighty nine version that was called Prince of Persia Classic. Oh God. It was just it was just using more mo- it was just using it was using the same con- same kind of control setup just with modern gra- just with a modern graphic. I remember playing the original. That not easy. No, the, yeah. I remember dying on the first screen of the original way too many times. Same. Of course, same. Of course, when I first played the original, I was like four. So. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I didn't know the only, half of what I was doing. The only game in the Prince of Persia series that I never played was 3D. Because I didn't know about it until years later. Mm-hmm. Right. Next we have a little something called Corrupt. Which is a little bit a little bit cute as far as the name goes. Instead of two R's, it's an R and an E. Because that's that's uh clever i'm being a bit facetious you're laying it on a little thick okay <laughs> sometimes i don't know if people know when i'm being facetious anymore because i tend to deadpan things okay so we're de- we're dealing with a um we're dealing with a weapons fighter um that looks to have the same kind of speed as the as the versus games. Not that I'm complaining. Um, what I am cu- what I am curious about is when it comes is whether is whether or not we're going to be whether or not we're going to be dealing with a f- with a fair amount when it comes to this, or if we're dealing with SNK bullshit. SNK, I love your fighting games, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Iori. Geese. I'm Hog. sorry. You remember that Iori was much more bullshit first before geese existed. Um. The fuck are you talking about? King of uh, uh different game series. I'm sorry. King of Fighters. Yeah, and King yeah, and King of and King of Fighters was building on Art of Fighting and Fatal Fury. So, what the fuck, man? <laughs> I don't know. I played King of Fighters before I played Art of Fighting or Fatal Fury, so that's probably why it sits first in my head. I mean, Eor, what I'm not denying that Iori was bullshit. I'm just Iori saying, is I'm... is always bullshit as a boss character. Even when they try to make him more balanced, he's still goddamn bullshit. I'm just saying, yes, and of course, well, you've played Art of Fighting, so you know how e- you know how every match was SNK boss syndrome. Stop it, <laughs> please no, no more, please stop, stop no, no more, please stop. But more on more on point, um, the the only other things that we know about Corrupt is that apparently they want to make it free to play. They don't have a release window besides soon. The free to play part is make me makes me a little bit cautious. Apparently, it's going to be supporting rollback netcode. Um, I kind of wish it would have used GGPO, but I can't have everything I want. I'll keep an eye out so so that I ha- so that I ha- so that I um have a better feel for what sort of what sort of fighting game I'm dealing with. But it's not like this is going to be at Evo or anything anytime soon. Probably not. So next we uh, um, we ended up getting the revelation of a mega mode for thirty double X. I'm still playing twenty double X. Why'd they have to go to thirty double X?
Although it look it looks like for it looks like for thirty double X they're going with a more traditional set of sprite setup instead of the not quite poly thing that they did that they did before. Yeah, I think that might be Mega Mode though that they're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Try any level, die, die and die and buy, retry. So I'm get I'm guessing the whole idea with Meg with with Mega Mode is um you're get you're given a lot you're given a lot of tools, but you but you've but you've got but you've got a lot less chances. Um, Mega Mode doesn't include permadeath. Oh. And each individual level in a run will stay the same until you complete it. Oh, so it's it's going to be something for for people who aren't total masochists. And then the game's levels are all procedurally generated when you start the run to keep each run fresh. Mega Mode's great for series newcomers, but it's also an awesome fit for players who are looking for a more traditional action platformer experience and folks who don't want to lose their progress when they die. All right, not too not too shabby on that front. Um, I'm still gonna end up grabbing um thirty double thirty double X, and I'm probably gonna be maining Ace again because I like Zero. Sue me. Why would I sue you for liking the superior character? Um, next, look, I I know that Destructive Creations got on the wrong foot with um hatred, but the stuff that they've done since then has shown that they um. They're not they're not the drizzling shits that everybody thought they were cuz um Battle Brothers has been pr a pretty good RTS and now they're working on War Mongrels. It a co-published work by All In Games who plays two former Wehrmacht Nazi soldiers who deserted. <laughs> And apparently they intend for this to be a spiritual successor to the Commando series. So we're dealing with a mix of RTS and stealth. I did like and that they playing. they said they said bugs will occur with this. Yep. And they uh I like the fact that they're that that it's too deserting Wehrmacht. That's mm -hmm. a interesting Interesting um, idea. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the thing that made the thing that made them desert was having to kill innocents on the Eastern Front. Yep. So. Be uh, I, I like how someone in the comments of this niche gamer article says, uh, "From boys to men in days, they open their eyes to the atrocities of war, and find their purpose in the fight to prevent further meaningless killing." And then they respond, they do this by systematically killing thousands of German soldiers in order to help the Soviets led by Joseph Stalin, who happens to be the greatest mass murderer in human history. Your plan makes no sense, boys. I'm like, but they're not helping. They're going west. If they're going west, they're heading towards the, the, the Allied landing at Normandy. Mm -hmm. So they're not helping the Russians by going further east and breaking down the... the, the this person in the in the uh, comments is uh, a numpty. He is suffering from hydrocephalus. Your what hurts? <laughs> hydrocephalus, waterhead. Ah. But yeah, I'm. I can definitely. This is the. Even though this is playing like an RTS, there's definitely the stealth el um, emphasis. Um, yeah. Which means this is probably going to kick my ass because Shadow Tactics kicked my ass. Desperados continues to kick my ass. And yet I keep coming back because I am a masochist. I mean. No, I just like someone who likes a challenge. That's what a masochist is someone who likes a challenge that they continue to fail at. We have different uh, definitions of, of the word masochist. Yeah. Um. 
and different understandings of how masochism works. Yeah. Now, speaking of masochism, Sin is getting a um, is getting oh the HD treatment. Oh, and so this... it's not going to look like a bunch of uh, erasers stuck to to um, action figures. Um, I have a little bit of hope for this one because it's being developed by Night Dive. Good. We won't have action figures that have little round cue ball heads. Oh, we're we're pro we're probably still we're probably still going to be dealing with with some of the, with some of that. Well, we are we are dealing with a '90s shooter, so keep that in mind. But um, Night Dive did and it did a very impressive job with Doom sixty four, for instance, to the point where their port of it is the best way to play that game. But there's definitely a um there's definitely a bit of a graphical improvement. Um, yep. And sin, the original Sin compared to its compared to its follow up episodes, is a is a is much bet is um is actually a pretty decent game. The problem is it came it came out in really horrible timing because, well, Half Life happened. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I guess the uh, once in a generation uh, industry defining game. Mm -hmm. And looks like it's going to have the original Sin and the Wages of Sin expansion, and completely ignoring the um, the um, Sin episode thing that nobody liked. So everything they're doing is smart. Got it. Mm -hmm. Um. That's just the only thing that I have some doubts on is um, having Andrew Holschild do remaster the soundtrack. Um, but geez, that guy gets around, man. <laughs> <laughs> I like, mean, is his music bad? No. There's cer okay. there are certainly there are certainly worse composers you can go you can go with. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Um, but speaking of shooters, um, Proteus is going to be heading into early access next month with closed beta signups available right now. I did try and sign up. I can't guarantee I'm going to actually get it. Don't you mean the month after? Mm-hmm. We're still in September. November tenth is two months from now. Sorry. Um, to be fair, this year this year has been tough to manage as far as time management. We don't know what the fuck day it is now. Yeah, but I have less of an excuse given all the interviews I do, and the fact that you know you did have a day job at one point, still do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Pro Proteus is. Well, yeah. Is it a Doom clone? Yes. On the other hand, um, it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while before before we get before we get anything else like this. And I um, I do have to wonder if some if somebody was playing Repu if somebody was playing Republic Commando because that's what I keep seeing when I look at that HUD. <laughs> but what's definitely going to help this game out is we have a level editor. That's nice. We have we have a we have a level editor and um this this does feel like cla this does feel like classic Doom Two more than anything else, although um Doom Two didn't jib like this seriously that's a lot of blood. Well, uh, it, they did say in their in their features, um, our art style infinite blood go crazy paint the walls red. Well, you can call him a lot of things. A liar is not one of them. <laughs> I but, like bl I like busting everything down into little giblets. Mm -hmm. Um. So then we have a Breath of the Wild prequel for High for Hyrule Warriors that got announced, which is going to be coming November twentieth, called Age of Calamity. And yeah, this did result in some bad takes that we that we talked about before we went live tonight. But um, look, I I like Hyrule Warriors. 
let me just skip, let me just skip ahead a little bit. So yeah, we're dealing with it. I could I could see some people asking why do why do this prequel in um in Hi in Hyrule Warriors and not Breath of the Wild. Given that this is supposed that this is that we're dealing with essentially a war and how things went to shit, I'd say it makes more sense here. Yep. Um, and it's a standalone game, so it's its own thing. That's really nice. Yeah. Let's well, um something to something to keep in mind with um Hyrule Warriors is who its co developer was. Team Ninja. Yep. Which might explain why this why it ended up working so well, because they know how to do an action game. Very much so. Well, what I what I will enjoy out of this is being able to to play as the other guardians, which is probably the reason why they ended up going with um with this approach instead of using Breath of the Wild's framework. It wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, I still think that the the ultimate uh, point you made about how uh, it's um, you know, it's it's a it's a war. So makes more sense to do it in a warlike fashion. Mm-hmm. Plus, if if we were doing Breath of the Wild, then we'd have to deal with that, you know yep. the you know the weapon breakage thing that nobody likes. Yeah, the one thing that I don't think they're going to do in the future. No. Um, At least we can hope. Yeah, speaking of um, beat 'em ups, one that I had hoped that I'd that I'd see come stateside is in the form of One Chanbara Origin. Nice. It's going to be October 14th on PC and PS4. Now, the art style did the art style change did take a little bit of getting used to for me. But mm -hmm. I've got but I've got no problem with I but um it was one that I was able to take to eventually. Um I've seen, some, I, of course, there's of course there's going to be some who are going to who are going to raise a stink of uh, about the game for um, obvious reasons. But to those to those people, I say, how does it how does it feel to to have no fun in your life? How do you go to sleep at night with that? <laughs> Only Chan, but uh, is a it's a game for uh, people of culture. Mm -hmm. Um, I do like that we ha that we seem to have a bit of a timing thing going on, so you can't really button mash. Well, you can't but you can't button. You have to be careful button mashing. Period, because getting to because getting too much blood on your weapons can result in problems. Yep. But I I know I whenever whenever we're dealing with these sort of beat 'em ups or Musou games or the like, I always hear somebody go about how repetitive the gameplay is or how or or something like that, and I'm like, you're technically right, you're technically um correct, but you're still wrong. Because a lot of times when people make these sort of complaints, they don't realize that part of the game is in crowd control. Yep. In the same in the same way that area control is what differs a two D fighter from a three D fighter. Controlling the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Very much doing what Sun Tzu always said to do. And I'm I'm pretty sure when it comes to the timing thing, I'm gonna suck at it at first, but um You know you know the old saying, what's the bit what's there's only one way to get into Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. practice. Yep. Um, another entry that I had that I had on 3DS that's now getting a PC port is 
um, is Code of Princess EX. Nice. And this was actually... Code of Princess was kind of a spiritual successor to Guardian Heroes back on back on the Saturn. Yeah. In, ter- in terms of his gameplay, not in terms of story, although nobody was playing um, Guardian Heroes for the story. <laughs> um, the... When it comes to the when it comes when it comes to the uh, game, when it comes to the game in question, it is it is very much a a very serviceable um very serviceable side scrolling beat 'em up with a little bit of le- with a little bit of a leveling setup and a lot of characters to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um. And some something that I do like is that for the for this EX version, other characters that you collect gain half of the XP you earn when you complete campaign quests. That makes it easier to level up your party. Yep, they're adjusting the skill system so stats upgrade automatically, replacing speed with resist to measure magical defense, along with redoing sprites and backgrounds for a better frame rate because they're not on the 3DS's hardware, which. Is not gonna ha- is not going to have the most guaranteed um, guaranteed frame guaranteed frame rate on when it comes to beat when it comes to the kind of frame rate you need for a beat 'em up. Yep. Um. Now next we have the Falconeer, which is apparently going to be launching November tenth. Um. Which a and apparently is going to be a launch title for the um, Xbox Series X. And am I the only one looking at this and get and getting flashbacks to th- to um to things like Dragon Guard and maybe a little bit of Panzer Dragoon? A little bit of Panzer Dragoon, I definitely see. Um, Dragon Guard. Not so much, but I see the Panzer Dragoon more than the Dragon Guard. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I'll have to keep an eye out to see if to see if they expand on to see if they expand on the matter. But the idea of the idea of driving around in a giant falcon, I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> um, also, it look, speaking of Doom, since we mentioned that earlier, it, it looks like the guy who did the brutal Doom mod is making his own game. Called well, brutal fate. Yeah. Um, it is. He has it. He has it slated for a early for an early access date of um. Of, of January. Some, yeah, of January. Um, and yeah, definitely, definitely has the amount of jib that we saw in Brutal Doom. Um. I wonder if he's building. I wonder if he's building this on on his own engine or on the um, GZ Doom engine. Which it's probably GZ. Question. It's probably GZ Doom because that uses Source. Yeah, and Source is easy to build with. Mm-hmm. Now, as far. As far as, as what I'm curious about is what it's going to do to establish its own identity. Because the thing is, there's no shortage of throwback FPSs right now. You're telling me. <laughs> and speaking of which, let's talk about Ultra Kill. Now that it's in early access. Mm hmm. A game that can be best described as Devil May Cry meets Quake. <laughs> yep. An unholy ballet of awesome. And the thing that I find interesting with it is the game actually discourages um fighting at fighting at um long range. <laughs> because Health pickups are very rare. In fact, in the first in the first um le- in the first level, I think I only found two. Oh, wow. And they were and they were in se- they were in secrets. 
the way the main way as they as these as the thing says blood is fuel when you kill when you kill enemies there's a there's a lot of splatter that splatter is how you heal yep that's an that's a mechanic right there mm -hmm. so yeah i can i can add that i can add and the other thing that i that i like with it is one they they put in a style meter a la devil may cry and two they they um they have a lot of options when it comes to maneuverability slides dashes double jumps air dashes all all the all the goodies you're never going to have a a um lack of an opportunity when it comes to moving around so nice. yeah i can add this as to another as to another reason why new blood has become one of my favorite companies over the last few years is They've yet to put out a bad game. I mean, when they do put out a bad game, I wi I will, I will rip it a new one. But um, hasn't Until happened yet. Time. Yeah. Until such time that they do put out a, a bad game, um, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing that we ended up getting was from is the fact that. Who remembers Hexen and or Heretic? Of course, I have both Heretic and Hexen and all of their stuff on on a uh, on Steam. Well, we're getting a successor for it next year called Graven. Yes, I've seen this. Nice. Oh, mm, very nice. You play as someone only known as the Priest, members of a member of a ortho orthogonal order who've been convicting for killing another priest. Who tried to sacrifice your daughter? Well, that would certainly make me kill the other priest. Mm -hmm. You you try to kill my daughter, I kill you. Yeah. Um, now, let's not make let's not make the dude the priest sound like uh, Tommy was so. That's not a bad look or a sound. <laughs> I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, oh, hi Mark. Mark. No, no, it still doesn't work. Yeah. But and we and after getting exiled, we find ourselves in a land consumed by plague. Um, they had all. They were also and Niche Gamer was kind enough to do, to um upload not just the first ten minutes narrated, but also thirty minutes worth of gameplay. And yep. the look of the look of this thing, this is very this is very much um a successor to Hexen. And, and the only thing that I hope we get ends up happening with this is dial back on the switch hunting. Let's learn from our past mistakes. Now they're going to put in twice as many switches just because you said something, Monk. Oh fuck it! Just to fuck with you. Because of course they would. Mm-hmm. You spoke it into existence. It's not our fault. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but e but even with even with that, what I'm what I'm seeing out of Graven, this holds some promise. I like the looks. It and looks really fun. I do find it amusing that 3D Realms has been doing pretty well for themselves as a publisher. I mean, why wouldn't they? They know what to publish. Mm -hmm. They also know that, that that by publishing instead of developing, they don't run into the when it's done problem. Yeah, that definitely can be a problem if you're not careful. They don't run into the when it's done problem, and they still get to... Uh, they basically get to have their cake and eat it, too. Mm-hmm. But it looks like we're gonna. It looks like we're possibly gonna be using a mixture of physical and magical weaponry, um, and they appa and apparently exploration is gonna be an emphasis, which does make me worried that we're gonna be hunting for switches. <laughs> but I also see that we've got a. Maybe it's just me, but I'm but I'm getting more of a heretic vibe than Hexen. Yeah. Which. 
I don't mind either because Heretic was a pretty good se was a pretty good series, and Heretic and Heretic Two, if you can find the thing, is really damn good. It's basically I, a it's basically a predecessor before Raven Software perfected how to do lightsaber combat in a video game. Let me check here. I think I'm not sure if it's available for I'm not sure if Heretic Two is available for sale anymore because of a um dispute. Yeah. No, I think uh I think Heretic um Yeah, you you with uh with the with the I got these games in a I think a humble bundle a while ago. A while while ago. Uh got Her Heretic Shadow of the Serpent Riders, Hexen Beyond Heretic, Hexen Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, and Hexen Two. Yeah, but Her Heretic Two wasn't wasn't in that night and, and I think I know why. And it's another instance why um why anybody doing a black and white attitude with piracy is an, is an idiot? Because I would love to recommend people buy Hexen Two, not Hexen Two, but a Heretic Two, yep. especially if they liked the um, especially if they liked um, Jedi Knight and Jedi Outcast. Yep. The problem is I can't. It's unf I would I would like to let I would like to give people a way to do it legit, but it's not possible. Yeah. But that, but hope, but hope, hopefully, hopefully that is something that's addressed in the future. For now, that that's going to that's going to do it for this particular episode. And I'd say this was much more of a success than last time. I think I'll do this um, for tomorrow. Yeah, I think a Google Meet is a much better idea. Uh, even if if there are sometimes crashes with people. Um, they're very few and far between. Mm -hmm. That that and uh, and tell you the 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 Discord issue is fixed. I mean, this is a da damn good plan B. Yeah, I'd say I'd say so. I'm s we'll um we'll def we'll definitely get we'll definitely get on get on that when the t when the time comes. And of course, and actually, I'm gonna be do I'm gonna be doing double duty tomorrow because um I'm get because I'm go I'm going to be having. The um, the guys from what the a certain dev team from Denmark um on my sh on the show tomorrow before, um Geek Watch, mm -hmm. and hope hopefully, and just as a reminder, the theme for Geek Watch is Super Sentai: The Drunken Sailor. Yep. Ooh. So look, so please look forward to that. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>